Hey, how's it going, everybody? Mark here, and we've got a little book reading today. I wanted to do a reading from a book called Spiritual Struggle by Elder Basios of the Holy Mountain, Mount Athos. He's a saint in the Orthodox Church, and I'm reading this book currently, and I wanted to read a chapter to you guys. Um, Probably not going to finish off the, the rest of that Father Sarah from Rose book. I really like those first two chapters. I feel like those are the key chapters. If you want to read the rest of that book, I highly recommend you grab a copy for yourself. You could do it online for $10 or less. And I highly recommend checking out that book. Those first two chapters are my favorite. And I feel like those are definitely the key chapters in that book. But there's definitely more to it. It goes into... Um, aspects of, of things that I kind of already knew but those two chapters for me were just like revolutionary those were crazy those were life-changing chapters for me so hopefully you guys got something out of those two and I got a lot out of this some of the chapters in this book this is a um, volume three actually so there's other volumes to this as you can see that's volume three of the spiritual struggle by elder Bayasios of Mount Athos so here, let's get right into it. I think I lost my place here, and that's okay. I have a bookmark in a different place. What we're looking for is... Not that chapter, the chapter right before it. Acceptance of Injustice. And let's get right into it. Geronda, when I am wronged, my heart becomes hardened. For your heart... Not to be hardened, you must never think that someone else is at fault, or how much that person is at fault, but rather how much you are at fault. You see, when people are at odds with one another, each of them thinks that he is in the right, and each thinks that he is entitled to more rights than the other person, and so they are constantly in disagreement. For example, they go to the police and each one says, The other fellow beat me! without revealing how much he himself beat the other, and he presses charges. If we only remember that Christ suffered the greatest injustice of all, then we would be ready to accept with joy every injustice done to us. Though God, he descended to earth out of infinite love and accepted to be confined in the womb of the Panagia, Panagia for nine months. Then he lived quietly for 30 years. From the age of 15 to 30, he worked as a carpenter among the Jews. Even the tools used in those days were very rudimentary and required hard work to transform rough pieces of wood into useful furniture. It is difficult for us to imagine how difficult the work of a carpenter was in those days. And after that, Jesus endured three years of hardships, wandering around barefoot and preaching. He healed the sick, restored the sight of the blind people with spittle and clay, and they still wanted him to show them signs and miracles. He cast out demons from the possessed, but unfortunately the ungrateful people claimed that he himself was possessed by a demon. And while so many had spoken and prophesied about him, and he had performed so many miracles, in the end he was mocked and crucified. This is why those who have suffered injustice are God's most beloved children. As wronged people, they hold the wronged Christ himself in their heart, and they rejoice in exile or in prison as if they are in paradise. Because where there is Christ, there is paradise. Geronda, is it possible for someone to bear too heavy a burden? God does not allow a burden that is beyond our strength. Indiscreet people place unbearably heavy burdens on others. The benevolent God often allows good people to suffer at the hands of evil people so that they can gather blessings for heaven. Geronda, is complaining related to ingratitude? Yes, it is quite possible for someone to be unaware of the care being provided for him and to complain about being wronged and treated unfairly. If he is not vigilant with himself, when he makes a mistake and people advise him to be careful, he may very easily imagine himself wronged by them and may even become impudent. For example, a sister may use too much pesticide and burn the olive trees. Someone advises her accordingly, but instead of acknowledging her fault and asking for forgiveness, she feels, wronged, she feels wronged and begins to weep and complain. They're unfair to me. If the locusts had come to destroy the trees, 
they wouldn't have said anything. But now that I am the cause of their destruction, they are shouting at me. Oh my lord, you are the only one who understands me. And the tears continue to flow. She may even feel a sense of joy, imagining that she will be rewarded for enduring the injustice and express gratitude to Christ. This is a false understanding of the situation, a serious error. This next section is called The Joy in Accepting Injustice. Geronda, when I gladly accept a reprimand for a mistake I have made, is what I am feeling pure? Look, if you cause damage and reprimand and people reprimand you and you do not complain but rather are happy saying, Glory be to God, I needed that reprimand. You have only half the joy. But if you do not do any damage and are unjustly reprimanded and you accept it with good thoughts, then you will have complete joy. I am not saying that you should seek unfair reprimands because then the devil will entangle you in the sin of pride, but rather that you should accept injustice when it comes your way naturally and be joyful in it. There are four stages in confronting injustice. Let's say someone strikes you unjustly. If you are at the first stage, you strike back. If you are at the second stage, you feel very upset inside, but control yourself and do not speak. At the third stage, you are not agitated by the injustice. But at the fourth stage, you experience great joy, extraordinary spiritual gladness. When someone is wronged and proves that he is not at fault, he is, un he is justified and feels satisfied. In this case, he feels a worldly joy. But if he confronts the injustice spiritually with good thoughts and without trying to prove that he is innocent, he, exper he experiences spiritual joy. That's when he has divine consolation in his heart and is moving in the realm of doxology, glorifying God. Have you any idea what joy can be felt by a soul that is wronged, but does not attempt to justify itself so that people will say, bravo, or I am sorry? It rejoices more in being wrong than in being justified. Those who reach this spiritual condition wish to thank the one who wronged them for the joy rendered in this life, but also for the eternal life that has been secured. How different is the spiritual form from the worldly? How different is the spiritual from the worldly? In the spiritual life, things are in reverse. When you are left holding the short end of the stick, then you feel good. And when you give it to someone else, you feel badly. When you accept an injustice and are prepared to justify your neighbor, you accept Christ himself into your heart, who is often wronged and maligned. It is then that Christ cannot be evicted from your heart and fills you with great peace and gladness. Try it, my children, and experience this great joy Learn to be happy with this spiritual joy, not with the worldly one, and every day it will be Easter. There is no greater joy than the joy you feel when you accept injustice. I wish everyone was unjust, unjust to me. I can honestly tell you that the sweetest spiritual joy I have experienced has been through accepting injustice. Do you know how much I rejoice when someone tells me that I am in error? Glory be to thee, O God, I say. From this I will get a reward, while if someone should call me a saint, I will be in debt. There is no sweeter thing than to endure injustice. One morning at my calabi, someone knocked at the door. I looked from the window to see who it was because it was not time to open yet. I saw a young man with a bright face and realized that he had had spiritual experiences since the grace of God on his face betrayed him. For this reason, even though I was busy, I interrupted what I was doing, opened the door, and invited him inside. I offered him some water and began to ask him about his life, seeing that he had had spiritual content. So I asked him, What do you do for a living, young man? What do I do for a living, father? He responded. I grew up in prison and spent most of my life there. I am now 26 years old. What did you do to be thrown into prison, young man? I asked him and he opened up his heart to me. From the time I was a child, I felt sorrow for all the unfortunate people who were suffering. I knew all these suffering people, not only in my parish, but also from other parishes, because the parish priest and parish council were constantly gathering funds for buildings, halls, and so on, or for various repairs. They had entirely neglected the poor families. I did not judge whether these projects were necessary or not, I only saw that there were many unfortunate and needy people. I would go secretly and steal 
from the money they were gathering for various projects. I would take a fair amount, but not all of it. Then I would buy food and other things, which I would leave outside the poor people's homes without anybody seeing me. Then I would go to the police directly and confess. I stole the money from the church and I've spent it, without saying anything more. I didn't want them to accuse someone else unjustly. Then they would beat me, call me names, but I kept silent. Then they would lock me up in jail for a period of time. This went on for years. The whole town of 30,000 people, as well as other nearby towns, knew me and ridiculed me as a notorious thief. I just kept silent and experienced an inner joy. Once they locked me up in jail for three years. Sometimes they would lock me up unjustly for a time. And when they caught the real thief, they would let me go. If they did not catch him, I would stay in jail for as long as his crime called for. That is why I told you, Father, that most of the years of my life have been spent in jail. I listened to him carefully and then told him, My young man, as good as this seems to be, it is not good, and you must never do it again. Listen to what I have to tell you. Will you do what I tell you? He said, I will, Father. I want you to go away from your hometown to another town where I know some good people who will help you get settled. There you will work and help the poor people as much as you can from what you earn. This is greater value. But even when one does not have anything to give to the poor but feels genuine compassion for them in his heart, then he offers a higher kind of charity because it, because it is the charity of his heart. For if he had something to give, he would feel joy, but when he has nothing to give, he feels pain in his heart. He promised to follow my advice and departed joyfully. After seven months, I received his letter from Coriadalus prison, in which he had written, Surely, Reverend Father, you will be surprised to receive my letter from this prison, after the direction you gave me to reform my life and the promise I had made to you. I want you to know that I am serving a jail sentence that I have already served. A mistake was made. Thank God that there is no human justice. Otherwise, spiritual people would be deprived of their heavenly reward. When I read the last words of his letter, I marveled at the young man who had taken so seriously the spiritual life and had comprehended the deeper meaning of life. A thief for the sake of Christ. He had Christ in his heart. He could not contain himself because of the joy he had experienced. He had a divine foolishness about him and was experiencing a spiritual celebration. Geronda, was he receiving his joy from the ridicule of the people? The joy came from the injustice. He was a worldly man who had not read the lives of the saints or the writings of the Holy Fathers. Even though he was unjustly beaten, imprisoned, and ridiculed as the town thief, he kept silent and faced everything in a most spiritual manner. He was a young man who did not care to establish himself, but only to help others. Notorious thieves are rarely imprisoned, while this young man was jailed twice for the same robbery, and he had been jailed unjustly for other robberies until they were able to find the real thief. But the joy this young man experienced was not to be found even among the entire population of his town. 30,000 little joys, the town's po whole population, could not amount to his great joy. This is why I say that a spiritual man does not have sorrows. When his love is increased and his heart is kindled with divine passion, there is no room for grief and sorrow. The great love for Christ overcomes the pain and suffering caused by people. The Rewards from Injustice Geronda, when I am unjustly accused by something a sister says about me, I can't bear it and I become cold toward her. Hold on a minute. What does the rule of the church say about this? How are we to categorize it? How can you be helped more? Let's assume that it's as you say, and you are not at fault. Now, if you have been unjustly wronged, then you have benefited spiritually. The other person, if she said something at your expense to justify herself, will be censored later by her conscience. She will repent and then look upon you with more love. This means two or three good things together. This way you are given the opportunity to be enriched and to become a noble young lady, not a street gypsy. Since God provides you with the opportunity to become a noble person, capable of giving to others, why would you want to remain a gypsy? Geronda, 
My thought insists that I should ask the sister how she understood my behavior and assumed me to be guilty. Of course this is the case, because the devil cannot bear to see you treasure a heavenly reward. He pressures you to seek justification for yourself and to throw Christ out of you. Geronda, from time to time when I make a mistake, I would like others to be a little forgiving. What do you want them to justify you? Let's say that they do. Spiritually, do you gain or lose by this? I lose. If you owned a store, would you want to have profits or losses? Profits. So if we don't want to lose out in vain worldly gains, how much more must we be careful not to harm ourselves spiritually? Worldly people seek material gain and don't let it go to waste. Is it right for spiritual people to throw away spiritual gain? But even if worldly people spend the money they have, they are at least wasting only material things, while we, when we do not accept an injustice, waste spiritual and heavenly things. We consume everything down here. Why trade the heavenly for the earthly? Also, the unfortunate worldly people are ignorant of the spiritual life, while we are aware of it. We espouse the monastic life in order to gain heaven. And, we, and while we started out for one place, we ended up at another. It is very distressful to see a worldly person executed or beaten or simply persecuted unjustly. But we, monks and nuns, must seek these things and endure them for the love of Christ. We should pursue dishonor, rejection, insult, because they bring spiritual benefit to our souls. For example, a family man has needs and seeks to be justified because he is thinking how his family will survive if he loses his reputation or goes bankrupt. For this reason, worldly people have an excuse, but we, monks and nuns, have none. When we are wronged and we accept this injustice, then in fact we gain. For example, am I wrongfully accused of having committed a crime and imprisoned unjustly? That's fine. My conscience is clear since I have not committed that crime. And on top of that, I have a heavenly reward. Is there a greater benevolence? I don't complain to God. Instead, I glorify God. How can I thank you, my Lord, that I didn't commit that crime? If I had, I wouldn't have been able to bear the pangs of remorse. That's when jail can become paradise. Has someone struck me unjustly? Glory be to you, O Lord. Perhaps I may be able to pay off a sin I too had once struck someone. Have I been insulted unjustly? Glory be to thee, O Lord. I accept it out of love for you, for you too were struck and slandered for me. Treasure in Heaven Geronda, I'm upset when others don't think well of me. It is good that you told me. From now on I will pray for others not to ever have a good opinion about you. For this will be to your benefit, my good child. God provides for people to wrong us or tell us some, some disturbing word that may help us redeem some debt of sin or to add to our treasure in heaven. I cannot understand what you expect the spiritual life to be. You have not yet come to realize what it is to your spiritual benefit, and you expect to be paid in full here. You leave nothing for heaven. Why do you see things this way? What are you reading? Do you read the Evergetinos? Doesn't it tell you there what to do? Don't you read the gospel? Read it every day. Geronda, when I do something good, I am saddened when others don't appreciate it. But what do you really want? Appreciation from Christ or from other people? Don't you get a greater blessing from recognition by Christ? How does it help you to have attention of people? If people now recognize the good you have done, then expect to hear in the next life, Thou in thy lifetime receive thy good things. We must rejoice when others do not acknowledge our efforts and do not repay us, because then these efforts will be taken into account by God and He will repay us with an eternal reward. Since there is a divine reward, we should try to put aside some drachmas in God's treasury. We should accept injustice as a great blessing, because it's a way of saving towards a heavenly blessing. Geronda, when someone accepts the injustice, not because he is thinking of the future judgment, but because he considers it a good thing, is this right? Well, doesn't it lead to the same thing? However, one must be careful not to do this just for the sake of being a good person, as Europeans seem to do. 
One must be aware that we are created in the image of God and are destined to grow in the likeness of our Creator. If this motivation is in place, then one is moving in the right direction. Otherwise, one is in danger of falling into the humanism of Europeans. Holy Hypocrisy Geronda How many Anchorites live in the Holy Mountain? I do not know. Some say that there are seven. For some years now it has been very difficult for one to find a quiet place and live aesthetically. aesthetically. That's why some fathers, when there are still some idiorhythmic monasteries on the holy mountain, would find another way to live ascetically. For example, they would say, I am not at peace at this monastery. I will go to some idior... Pardon me? Idiorhythmic monastery to work and collect some money. And the fathers there would believe me. They would actually go to such a monastery and work for three or four months. And then they would ask for a huge raise in pay. When it was not given to them, they would say, It's not worth staying here. I'm leaving. They would take some dry bread and leave, seeking a remote cave to hide and live ascetically. Others imagined that they had gone to work in yet another monastery. And when the fathers asked in that monastery about such and such a monk, they would invariably answer, Oh yes, he came by and was very peculiar. He wanted to collect money from us and then wanted a raise of pay. A monk asking for a raise? What kind of monk is he? As a result, these anchorites received a blessing from their ascetic labors and from the condemnation of others, and also from thieves. For thieves would hear that these anchorites had, had made money and would seek them out. After tormenting them to find their money, they would, of course, find none and leave them alone. Geronda, how can I imitate a sister's virtue if she conceals it? She would be crazy if she didn't conceal it. The saints put more effort into concealing their virtue than in acquiring it. Do you know what the fools for Christ did? First, they would escape the hypocrisy of the world and would enter the realm of evangelical truth. But this, too, was not enough for them, and they advanced to another level known as holy hypocrisy for the love of Christ. Having reached that, they were no longer perturbed no matter what was done to them or what was said to them. But in order to be able to reach this, a great deal of humility is necessary. While a lay person would be offended if something negative was said to him, or if he were not complimented for something he did, these anchorites actually rejoiced when others thought badly of them. In the old days, there were some fathers who pretended to be possessed by a demon in order to conceal their virtue and to give others cause to change their high opinion of them. When I was in the monastery, of Philothio, which was idiorhythmic at the time, there was a father who previously had been leading an ascetic life in Vijlak. As soon as the fathers there had taken notice of his advanced ascetic life, he requested a blessing from his spiritual father to go away. In departing, he said, I am tired of eating moldy dried bread here. I will go to some idiorhythmic monastery where I can eat some meat, as well as live like a real human being. I would be crazy to stay here. He then went to the monastery of Philatio and pretended to be possessed by demons. His former fellow monks heard that he was possessed and said, What a shame! The for poor fellow became possessed. No wonder this happened to him, for he left us because he was tired of eating moldy dried bread and went to an idiorhythmic monastery to eat meat. What did he actually do? For more than twenty-five years, he neither cooked nor slept. All night long, he wandered through the corridors with a lantern to keep awake. When he became tired, he would lean against the wall, and if he began to fall asleep, he would again startle himself awake by saying in a whisper the Jesus prayer, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me. Then he would continue the prayer in his mind. Sometimes his voice shook with a violent outburst of the Jesus prayer and was loud enough to be heard. And when he would meet a father, he would say, Pray, pray, so the demon will leave me. So everyone considered him to be possessed by a demon. A young novice told me one day, There goes the possessed. But I told him, Don't call him that. He is a virtuous monk, but he pretends to be possessed. After that, the young novice had reverence for him. 
When he died, the fathers found him holding a piece of paper which contained the name of each monk and next to it a derisive nickname for each of them, thus seeking even in death to prevent any good thoughts from anyone about him. Nevertheless, his relics gave off a wonderful fragrance. You see, he tried to hide himself, but the grace of God gave him away. For this reason, one must not draw conclusions about a person from his appearance, especially if one cannot discern what is actually hidden within. And that's going to conclude our reading for today. Glory to the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, both now and forever, and to the ages of ages. Amen. Have a good day, guys.